So I'd like to talk about embracing the complexity and uncertainty of climate change. So last winter, I attended a carbon and climate listening session at the Northwest Horticulture Experiment Station outside of Traverse City, Michigan. Fruit growers from across the state sat in the center of the room and with assistance of a moderator conveyed their concerns about climate change and the potential impacts on their livelihoods with research scientists and, and extension personnel sitting along the outside of the room listening. Over the past decade, fruit production in this region has been hard hit by extreme climate events, specifically abnormally warm springtime temperatures which bring flower buds out of hardiness, followed by sub-freezing minimum temperatures. These recent events have raised awareness among growers of the potential for changing patterns of springtime heat accumulation and freeze damage under a perturbed climate. At the end of the session, our growers summarized their concerns with the statement, we are the canary in the coal mine for climate change. Clearly, the Michigan fruit industry is not the only canary of climate change. We only need to think of the potential risks to residents of coastal areas or the changing indigenous livelihoods in high latitude regions among many, many others to bring to mind the numerous at-risk populations, natural systems, and economic activities. But as a listener that day, this grower's concern highlighted to me my personal responsibility and that of other scientists, including geographers, to assist vulnerable populations to prepare for and adapt to climate change and to do so in a manner that provides robust, actionable information. So geography as a discipline has been extremely active in assessments of climate change impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation. In addition to contributing directly to the extensive scientific literature on climate change and also to the literature on approaches for climate assessments, geographers have played leading roles in surveying, integrating, and synthesizing science within and between scientific disciplines and across sectors and regions as part of international assessments such as that as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and of national assessments such as the U.S. National Climate uh, Change Assessment. They also have been participants and even founding members of boundary organizations such as NOAA's Integrated Science and Assessment Center. There isn't an assessment center on that map that doesn't have a geographer uh, integra uh, integrally involved. In these roles, geographers have actively engaged stakeholders to co-explore vulnerability and potential impacts and have worked collaboratively to identify possible adaptation strategies. A challenge that geographers and others face as we work with various stakeholder groups is how to communicate the complexity and the uncertainty surrounding climate change and how to incorporate this complexity and uncertainty into planning and into decision making. We are often advised to keep the message simple with strong arguments even made that communicating uncertainty is hindering climate change action. Communicate the knowns before the unknowns, we are told. But is this the approach we should use as we work within the framework of a climate assessment? Decision scientist Barash Fishhoff has described climate change communication as either advocacy-based or non-persuasive and argues that scientists, although traditionally trained to consider uncertainty, multiple approaches, and a range of data sources, often turn to an advocacy-based communication when they are highly concerned about the potential consequences of either action or inaction, or when they believe that the science will not receive a fair hearing. In advocacy-based communication, a case is made for the specific viewpoint and uncertainty is introduced only through arguments with contrasting viewpoints. Advocacy-based uh, advocacy -based communication has its place and numerous examples exist of well-crafted mes messages influencing public opinion and contributed to needed action and change. However, a potential consequence is the loss of confidence in and appreciation for science by the public and stakeholder groups. Furthermore, the failure to consider uncertainty in a climate change assessment setting can lead to decision making that is not robust. As an alternative, Fischoff argues for what he refers to as non-persuasive communication, an approach that explicitly considers complexity and uncertainty and allows the science to speak for itself. 
Fishaw's argument for non-persuasive communication resonates strongly with me, and in this address, I attempt to make the case that it is the responsibility of geographers and others involved in climate change research and in planning for climate change to consider complexity and uncertainty as an integral part of their activities and to engage in non-persuasive communication in addition to advocacy-based communication. Stated differently, I argue that for many circumstances, but particularly for climate assessments, a simple message or approach may be insufficient or inappropriate. In my opinion, complexity and uncertainty are often inadequately addressed in climate assessments, sometimes even downplayed. But robust decision making in the face of climate change necessitates that this complexity and uncertainty be embraced rather than minimized as adaptation strategies are developed, evaluated, and implemented. So a little about context. My arguments are heavily influenced by my experience as a member of a climate change assessment team, most often for assessments related to agriculture, as Mona pointed out, and two of the examples are shown on the slide. On these teams, I'm usually the climate projections person, helping to identify climate parameters and projections most, re most relevant to the assessment goals and to guide their use and interpretation throughout the assessment process. That role has certainly influenced my thinking on incorporating complexity and uncertainty in climate assessments, and my perceptions may very well differ for team members who play different roles in the assessment process. But it is these differences in perspectives that when heard and integrated can lead to more successful assessments and improved decision making. So a couple of de uh, definitions before I move into the core of the presentation. What do I mean by a climate assessment? So following the definition from the IPCC, a climate assessment is simply a framework characterized by multiple approaches that can accommodate a variety of methods and that is used to evaluate the potential impacts of climate change, vulnerability to future climate, and adaptive capacity. The overall goal of an assessment is to inform decision making in an environment of uncertainty. From my personal experience, climate assessments can be particularly useful and effective when they are a co-exploration and a co-production between stakeholders and scientists and other experts. In this presentation, I'm using the terminology of robust decisions and robust decision making in their most general sense, with robust being an adjective rather than a noun, specifying a specific decision making framework. Following Wilby and Desai, I consider robust decisions to simply be strategies that are expected to perform well across a range of possible future conditions and are preferable to those that are optimal for one scenario but may perform badly for under a different but also probable scenario. There are, of course, multiple sources of complexity and uncertainty that could be and should be considered as part of a climate assessment. Today, I would like to highlight five sources namely the interpretation and use of multimodal ensembles of climate projections, the structural uncertainty of, of, uh, and assumptions of impacts models, the incorporation of spatial linkages into an assessment in a meaningful manner, valuing co-benefits, and the uncertainty surrounding vulnerability. So let's begin then with the interpretation and use of multimodal ensembles of climate projections. Some of you may be rolling your eyes at this first item and mummering, mummer, mumbling under your breath, oh, not climate ensembles again, and you have a point. Because the majority of past climate assessments have employed a top-down approach, or what some more critically would uh, refer to as predict than act, the uncertainty of climate projections, which are the starting point of a top-down approach, have received more attention than any other component of a climate assessment. And one of the most robust conclusions from climate model evaluation studies is that there's no single best model for all locations, periods, or variables of interest. Consequently, ensembles, which are typically developed from simulations from multiple global climate models driven with different greenhouse gas emission scenarios or concentration pathways, are widely used. Most often, ensembles are communicated to stakeholders and other members of an assessment team as a multi-model mean, or in other words, the average of the individual ensemble members. 
The image on this slide is an example from the latest U.S. National Climate Assessment and displays the multi-model mean of a 15-member ensemble of global climate models. The popularity of multi-model means in part reflects previous experience with median range forecasting, which also uses ensembles and has found for their application that the ensemble mean is a better predictor than a single ensemble member. Multi-model means are also popular simply because of the challenge to efficiently and effectively convey a large number of projections to stakeholders. A major implication of using multi-model means to communicate climate scenarios is that as a result, most stakeholders do not have readily available to them the suite of projections, which is an essential component to identifying robust adaptive adaptation strategies that perform well across a range of possible future conditions. Another concern regarding a multi-model mean is that it may be misleading when some members of an ensemble project a positive change in a climate variable while others project a negative change. In this case, the multi-model mean of the projected change can approach zero even though the individual ensemble members project a substantial change but of opposite side. The nearer zero ensemble mean may be interpreted by stakeholders or the public as no change, when arguably a more formative interpretation is that the nature of the change is uncertain. The ensemble means of seasonal pre precipitation shown on this image were derived from the dynamically downscale projections developed by the National North American Regional Climate Change Assessment Program, or NARCAP. Note that the multi-model means hover near zero for summertime precipitation in the northern Midwest. Without any more information on the individual ensemble members, the usability of this information for planning for climate change is compromised. My colleagues and I have generally preferred to display a range of an ensemble as shown in this screenshot from a web-based support tool that we developed for stakeholders within Michigan's agriculture and tourism industries. But these displays are also difficult to interpret. Ensemble members are interdependent as climate models employ similar numerical schemes and parameterization. Because of this interdependence, consensus among projections should not be confused with skill or reliability, nor should the ensemble distribution be thought of in terms of a traditional probability distribution as one might with a distribution of observations. So moving on then to the structural uncertainty and the assumptions of impacts models. So few stakeholders can directly utilize future projections of climate uh, variables in their decision making. Instead, they require information on changes in climate influence parameters or relevance for ma management and decision making for their activity or their industry. Thus, it is common to feed climate projections into impacts models, also referred to as response models, that translate the climate information into changes in management-related variables. To date, an assessment typically employs a single impacts model. The structure of that model can range from primarily empirical to process-based models, and the uncertainty assessment is often limited to evaluation of the parameter of uncertainty of the model for current conditions. Only recently has the structural differences in impact models been recognized as an important additional source of uncertainty um, for climate assessments and that it's, there is a need to use climate impacts ensembles compri comprised of multiple impacts models to help quantify uncertainty. As pointed out by Andrew Schandler and others, impacts ensembles are different from climate change ensembles. Impacts models involve calibration towards a small subset of variables such as crop yield or stream flow as opposed to climate models that simulate the broad set of properties of a closed system. Model evaluation is often difficult because of the lack of adequate data, particularly at regional scales. And impacts models are prone to unknown compensation for errors, making it difficult to separate calibration from tuning. Furthermore, impacts models are often developed for a region or a specific purpose and may perform poorly outside their design region or their design activity. Thus, it is essential to explore differences and the reason for any differences between impacts models. 
Recent comparisons as part of the ongoing agricultural model intercomparison improvement project, uh, known as AGMIP, highlight the importance of addressing the uncertainty surrounding impacts models. In a recent intercomparison, they found that the magnitude of the uncertainty in projected wheat yield that was introduced by structural differences in the alternative yield models was as large or larger than that introduced by the different downscaled climate projections. A particular significance in explaining model differences was how the wheat models dealt with the temperature stress at the time of anthesis, the onset of flowering, with some models not even incorporating a direct temperature effect at this growth stage. Again, Chandler and colleagues have recently called for what they refer to as a full treatment of uncertainty through the integrated treatment of climate and impacts model change. Whereas Sonia Vermeulen and colleagues recently demonstrated the usefulness of decomposing the uncertainty introduced into an agricultural assessment from climate uncertainty, shown in blue in this diagram, crop model uncertainty, shown in green, and natural variability, shown in orange, and how the relative magnitude of the different sources of variability changes with time. Note that the uncertainty introduced by natural variability is large at the beginning of the period and decreases with time, whereas assume, whether assuming no adaptation, left-hand plot, or temperature adaptation, the right-hand panel. However, these types of efforts are very infrequent. Another concern is the lack of consideration of the assumptions of the impacts models in the context of the nature and the limitations of the climate information that is fed into these models. That said, several recent publications represent initial steps in addressing this concern. In particular, Offhammer and colleagues illustrated that the high degree of spatial autocorrelation in gridded climate observations can violate the independence assumptions of empirical economic models that are often used in assessment studies. And they recommended that station observations may be the more appropriate choice of climate information for the development and application of these types of models. Their findings have implications for the current movement, movement to identify trusted data sets for the use in climate assessments, as a data set labeled as trusted may violate the assumptions of a particular impacts model. Okay. Spatial linkages are a source of a complexity that is partic of particular interest to me. So much of the existing climate assessment literature can be described as place-based, taking the view, whether consciously or subconsciously, that the effects of climate change are isolated to that particular sector under study within a specific region. These studies emphasize the unique aspects of a location or region and generally disregard the complexity of the broader spatial linkages which exist regionally, nationally, and internationally. For example, the Midwest region of the United States is a primary producer of soybean and potential regional climate change is a major concern for in industry stakeholders. But in the world context, Soybean prices and trade are affected by climate effects on other major soybean production regions, such as South America, and by worldwide demand. Consequently, relative changes in the productivity of one region in comparison to other production regions have implications for the viability of the agricultural activity at a particular location. Okay, the local focus of most climate assessments is in part a reflection of the two primary assessment strategies, top-down or impacts-focused assessments, as illustrated on the left-hand side of this slide, versus bottom-up or vulnerability-focused assessments, as illustrated on the right-hand side. Although their starting points differ, the spatial emphasis for, for both is local or regional. But the importance of spatial linkages in planning for and adapting to climate change cannot be overemphasized. This was actually brought home to me by a fruit, Michigan fruit grower. As, as I mentioned earlier, several colleagues and I developed a web-based decision support tool to deliver future projections of relevant climate variables to stakeholders in uh, the Michigan, particularly for Michigan's sour cherry industry. 
When I was demonstrating the two, a grower asked me how the climate, and particularly springtime freeze ha hazard, might change in the fruit growing region of Poland, which currently is the largest exporter of sour cherry worldwide. This grower felt that differential changes in climate between the Polish and Michigan production areas had the potential to change the balance of worldwide exports, in turn making production in Michigan more or less profitable. Current climate change assessment frameworks are not designed for understanding these linkages. As mentioned earlier, top-down approaches as illustrated on the left-hand side of the diagram, and bottom-up assessments largely ignore these spatial linkages, providing assessments for a specific activity in a specific region. Whereas large-scale integrated assessments explicitly consider global linkages, but do so at a scale too coarse for decision-making by stakeholders. Thus, few options are currently available for incorporating spatial linkages of relevance to a region, yet preserving the granularity and assessment outcomes that is often needed for decision making at the local or regional level. This represents an important and immediate concern for assessment studies. The Climate and Markets Project, or what we call CLIMARC, is currently attempting to address this void uh, in using the sour cherry industry in uh, worldwide, which is mostly centered in Michigan and Central Europe, as an example of international market commodities, and to model then the differential impact of climate change on yield and the implications for demand and supply, international trade, and regionally specific and industry-wide adaptation. This network diagram provides an overall view of our strategy. Uh, it's hard for us to follow at times, too, on that. But I wanted to show you at least that we're working towards some results on that. And this diagram shows in a sensitivity analysis of world trade to a reduction in cherry production in Michigan. But this work is only a small initial step to incorporating important spatial linkages into climate assessments. So an additional complexity is the potential co-benefits of adaptation, adaptation strategies. Co-benefits refer to both inter, intentional or direct benefits of specific actions or policies and to the secondary or ancillary benefits of these policies. For the most part, co-benefits are ignored in assessment studies. And in, as an example, co-benefits were mentioned in only one chapter, human health, of the recently published Midwest Technical Import, Input Report for the U.S. National Climate Assessment, and that was extensively surveyed the peer review literature and the gray literature on climate change in the region. This neglect can lead to non-robust decision making. Most research on, on uh, co-benefits has focused on the co-benefits of mitigation strategy. For example, improved human health is a potential co-benefit of a greener transportation system, supplementing the direct benefit of decreased greenhouse gas emissions. Only recently have the co-benefits of adaptation strategies begun to receive attention. Multiple co-benefits can be postulated for adaptation strategies. For example, the use of green roofs to reduce the impact of warmer temperatures on residents of urban environments can also contribute to more efficient use of water resources. Agricultural practices to decrease soil moisture loss can lead to reduced soil erosion. More sustainable man land management may be a co-benefit of adaptation strategies to maintain biodiversity. Robust decision making requires that the co-benefits of adaptation strategies be considered to a greater extent than currently. Identifying and evaluating these co-benefits is complex, however, and little guidance is currently available to assist assessment teams with this task. Challenges for climate change assessments include anticipating the wide range of possible co-benefits from adaptation strategies, valuing them both quantitatively and qualitatively, and including co-benefits then in informed decision making. And one less uncertainty source, and that is the uncertainty associated with vulnerability assessments. Early in this presentation, I mentioned that the two most well-known assessment strategies, top-down or impacts-based approaches, uh, and then the second bottom-up or vulnerability-focused approaches. Uh, 
To date, the vast majority of assessments have employed a top-down strategy. That is not, thus, it's not surprising that the uncertainty surrounding climate projections has received the most attention in the assessment literature. Recently, however, there has been a push for bottom-up assessments to complement and expand on top-down assessments and even for integration of the two assessment strategies. These developments, however, have brought to the fore that the treatment uncertainty in vulnerability assessments is still immature with little explicit treatment of either imprecision or ambiguity. For example, the uncertainty surrounding, surrounding adaptive capacity is poorly understood. And an important next step in assessment studies is to develop mechanisms for evaluating and communicating the uncertainty of top, bottom, excuse me, uncertainty of bottom up approaches. So moving forward, let's return to the sour cherry industry. It is, it is admittedly a small industry compared to other agricultural co uh, commodities. But for Northwestern Michigan, where which produces over 70% of the U.S. supply. It has a, a substantial impact on livelihoods and lifestyles and on the landscape itself. It is highly sensitive to weather and climate extremes, and it requires long-term capital investment, which in turn limits short-term adaptation options. In addition, the industry faces a number of other stressors, such as land use pressure and changes in consumer preferences. Planning for the future is challenging for this interest in industry. But the sour cherry industry is not alone. All sectors will be impacted by climate change to some degree, and an understanding of the complexity of the problem along with the uncertainty uh, will provide a foundation for more robust adaptation strategies. Complexity and uncertainty do not equate with lack of information, but rather uncertainty is in itself information. Neglecting complexity and uncertainty can lead to future agendas and policy that are misinformed. In sum, adapting a proactive attitude towards the utilization of uncertainty and complexity will benefit everyone in the long term. We need to recognize those contexts where communicating complexity and uncertainty will promote robust decision making and develop the appropriate communication strategies. So to, I would like to also uh, acknowledge then uh, the funding agencies for the projects that have really influenced my uh, uh, thoughts on climate change assessments, but also have provided me with the opportunities to be involved in these assessments. Our earlier top-down Pilius project for Michigan's agriculture and uh, tourism industries was funded by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Climark is uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessment Center, which is a joint effort between the University of Michigan and Michigan State University, is funded by the NOAA Climate Program office. Now, I also would be remiss to not thank the many stakeholders who have given me their patience and their time and have opened my mind and my eyes to the importance of the co-exploration uh, as being such an important component of climate assessments. And I also want to thank my colleagues from the Pilius and Climark projects. Some of us have been working together for over a decade. Um, the insights they've given me is particularly on interdisciplinary research. And I thank you all for your attention. So.